Our story continues. As chaos overtook Sarum, Achilleos' first thoughts were not for himself, nor even for Odysseus. Rather, they were for Cerinthia, caught in the open like so many others. The hunter dodged a spinning wagon wheel and what appeared to be the remains of a scarecrow on a cross as he rushed toward Cyrus's daughter. From farther away, Achilleos sighted the traitor also running toward her. However, having stood nearer the hunter, Cerinthia did not notice her father, nor could she hear him. At that moment, a massive fragment of roof suddenly tore off the guard's headquarters. It fluttered in the air like a gigantic black bird suffering its death throes, then dropping with the accuracy of an executioner's axe toward the unsuspecting Cyrus. Achilleos tried to shout, but as with the traitor, he could not be heard over the gale of wind. A chill coursed through him. The hunter knew that there was but one choice left to him. The moment that he could, Achilleos leapt for Cerinthia. He tackled her much the way he would have game, seeking to escape one of his snares. He did not care. All that mattered to him was keeping the traitor's daughter from witnessing the horrible scene to come. Nothing could be done for Cyrus, who was too far away. Even though he managed to smother her view, Achilleos could do nothing for his own. He watched in macabre fascination as the piece of roof caught Cyrus from behind. The force with which it struck the back of the man's neck ensured that there would be no hope for him. Indeed, the sharp edge severed bone and flesh with awful ease. The veteran hunter knew exactly what Cyrus's horrific beheading must have sounded like. The rest of the mangled roof collapsed on top of the body immediately after, thankfully obscuring the grisly sight. Cerinthia chose that moment to finally struggle free. Her expression was one of surprise, and perhaps a little embarrassment, if her reddening cheeks were of any sign. Achilleos suddenly felt very uncomfortable, and not merely because of having witnessed the fate of her father. Let me up, please, she called, her voice barely audible. Have you seen Odysseus? Unaware of Cyrus's tragic end, her first thoughts naturally went to the farmer and no one else. Certainly not Achilleos. Now was not the time for Serenthia to know, the hunter thought. If she tried to uncover her father's body in the midst of this insane weather, it was very possible that she would merely end up joining him in death. I saw him run toward the smithy, he finally shouted in response to her question and had to repeat himself several times until she finally understood him with all the noise. He pulled her to her feet, careful to avoid turning her in the direction of the grisly sight. Hold my hand tight or you'll be blown back. Achilleos continued in the direction he had last seen his friend, a violent wind buffeting him as hard as any wild boar. The farmer was considered a prisoner and a possible murderer in the eyes of some, and Achilleos' duty should have been to either convince his friend to return and face justice, or, failing that, force him to do so. But the hunter had already seen enough of what passed for justice, and the very thought of turning Odysseus over to the Inquisitors, or even Tiberius, left Achilleos feeling cold. More important to him was that if he brought Odysseus back to Serum to face charges, he had no doubt that he would forever blacken himself in the eyes of Cerinthia. They raced for the edge of the village even as others ran past them in different directions. Planks tore off buildings adding to the dangerous debris flying about. A water bucket ripped from a village well and smashed into the chest of one of Tiberius's men, sending him falling to his back. Achilleos wanted to stop and help him and see if others still lived, but he feared that doing so would place Cerinthia in even more danger. With much relief, he plunged himself and Cyrus' daughter into the woods. His attuned senses immediately noticed the difference between the weather there and the mad turbulence in Serum. It was almost as if he had just shut a door behind him. The foliage barely shook or moved and the howling had all but ceased. Achilleos did not pause until they were well away from the village's edge. Only then did Achilleos stop near a tremendous oak, more so for his companion's sake than his own. Are you all right? He immediately asked her, gasping for breath. Cerinthia nodded. Her gaze began to shift around the woods, seeking. We'll find him, Zeri. He muttered, a little put out after having helped her escape the chaos. His thoughts flashed to Cyrus, and guilt overwhelmed him. I wonder if... 
The trader's daughter began, halting abruptly as some unexpected hush filled the area. The two glanced back at their home. The lightning had ceased striking and the wind had died down too. Most astonishingly, not only were the clouds thinning, but it actually looked as if the sun was already trying to peek through. Praise be a miracle, uttered Cerinthia. Achilleos, on the other hand, felt a peculiar sense of dread inside of him, a sensation he had experienced but only one other time before, when he had first touched the ancient stone with Mendeln. Cerinthia took a step back to Sarum, but the hunter pulled her deeper into the woods. Odysseus, he reminded her. Even if the farmer wasn't the only reason for wanting to be away from the village just now. This way, remember? Cerinthia nodded, and once more a look of determination flashed across her beautiful face. Achilleos wished that just once an expression such as that would be reserved for him. Achilleos recalled seeing Odysseus head in this direction, but somehow found tracking his friend far more troublesome than he would have expected. It seemed that Odysseus barely left any trace of his passing. The hunter had to guess most of the time, because the farmer seemed to move through the woods with even greater stealth than an animal, if not for that certain sense that Achilleos never mentioned to anyone, which gave him an advantage when seeking a target, then it would have been impossible to keep after Odysseus. It was that same sense of knowing that enabled Achilleos to ever follow the correct trail. It also told him that someone else had met Odysseus in the woods. It was not a familiar trail, but he suspected it to be of the noblewoman from its light touch, and whatever seemed to cloak Odysseus did so for her as well. Her trail was even harder to maintain focus on. For some reason, that made Achilleos think of the stone again. Strange and unsettling things had kept happening some of them undeniably unnatural in his eyes. Achilleos recalled the symbols and wondered if perhaps, with time, Mendeln could translate them. Mendeln was clever. Perhaps he could even explain the terrible storm. He paused in his tracks, causing Cerinthia to stumble into him. He looked behind him, feeling that there was someone back there. What is it? Nothing. He tugged her forward again. Achilleos could not go back for Mendeln. Odysseus' brother would have to fend for himself. Surely, whatever it was, he was safe. The archer could not even recall seeing him earlier when his brother had been brought out before Brother Michaelius. <sighs> he can fend for himself. He is very clever. I have to find some way to tell her about her father. Achilleos repeated to himself. Mendeln had arrived at the outskirts of the village, just as it had seemed that the skies had declared war on his people. In contrast to the chaos for the rest of Sarum's inhabitants, he just stood there, watching in fascination as nature acted in a manner not entirely contrary to what he knew to be correct. Storms did not without warning strike so particularly. Wind did not blow with tornadic strength within village limits, only to die down right at his feet. Only when the phenomenon had ceased without warning did Mendel stir himself to enter Sarum. The village lay in ruins. More than one person lay still on the ground. The enormity of what had taken place began to sink in, and so too did the fact that it had proven most timely for Odysseus. The last point was further emphasized for Mandeln as he passed the burnt carnage that he somehow knew was all that remained of the robed figure he had recognized as the High Cleric from the Cathedral of Light. The gruesome sight should have sent Mendeln retreating, but through some morbid fascination it drove the younger son of Diomedes further toward the ghoulish corpse. As he neared the tattered remains, a violent sensation akin to a hard fist struck him with full force. Mendeln staggered back and had an unnerving feeling that someone was screaming fiercely at him. He continued to retreat, suddenly not wanting to be anywhere near that burnt corpse. At that moment, someone behind him cried out, Where is she? I can't find her. I can't find her. Mendel turned at the voice, but saw nothing. After a brief pause, he continued to search for his brother. Ah, good. Mendel, have you seen her? Have you seen my daughter? Out of the corner of his eye, Mandel saw a figure standing near a huge piece of torn roof littering the ground. However, as he turned toward the voice again, 
the figure seemed to vanish, or perhaps it was never there in the first place. He felt that he had somehow recognized the figure. Master Cyrus? He called hesitantly. Master Cyrus? There came no answer, but again, Mendel was filled with a strange compulsion to approach the wreckage from the roof. As he neared, he could sense something beneath the wood. Tugging at the rubble, the wood proved heavier than he had imagined. But by choosing to use his mass to slide it toward him, he had managed to make some progress. Slowly, what had been hidden was revealed to the light, at which point Mendel let out a garbled cry and let the wreckage loose from his fingers. He shook his head. A dismay he had not felt since the death of his parents and siblings rising up to overwhelm him. At that moment, a familiar voice called out again to him. Where is she? Where is my Serendia? It was at that moment that Mendown had realized that the voice was in his head. Quickly, a sharp point caught him in the small of his back. He started to turn, only to be seized roughly by more than one pair of powerful hands. The stern face of an Inquisitor guard came within inches of his. You, barked the figure. You are kin to that accursed heretic and murderer, Odyssean Uldiomed. Admit it. Someone identified you earlier as his brother. Mendel, still struggling to comprehend what had just happened, nodded mutely. Unfortunately, that proved to be his captor's cue to drag him through the village toward where a group of locals stood pensively with four other Inquisitor guards watching over them. Mendel estimated there to be nearly twenty people in this group, their eyes wide and movement reminding him of sheep heading towards a slaughter. There was no sign of Tiberius, and a few of his remaining men stood with Dorius while he argued with minions from the Cathedral of Light. Everyone seemed confused and unsure of what to do. But you have no right to be holding these good people, stated the headman. Under the authority granted by the signed agreements between Kajan and the cathedral, we have what right we need or desire, the lead cathedral guard stated. And in scope of that, the authority your captain held is ceded to us. You will obey all orders of the cathedral, and the first is to remove your headman and confine him to his quarters. One of the locals put a tentative hand on Dorius. What, 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 what should we do? I, I won't budge, insisted Dorius. Then, if these will disobey, I will have no choice but to have some of my own deal with you, and them afterwards. The headman glanced at the cathedral's fearsome warriors, then at his own. Reluctantly, he turned and led his guard away. With Dorius's retreat and Tiberius missing, Mendel now suspected that the captain was perhaps one of those struck down. It now seemed that the fate of Odysseus's brother and the rest of those gathered was squarely in the hands of the cathedral's inquisitor guards. Mendel did not share the same loathing that his brother did for the sect. But at that moment he could not think of a worse fate for any innocent than that which was awaiting them now. The cathedral must have thought that this incident had to have been some act of magic, a notion that even Mendel himself could not entirely rule out. Move to the circle, growled the cathedral guard. As Mendel stumbled toward the others, those nearest him immediately shunned him and pressed against their fellows in fear of him. Even those who had known him since childhood now looked at him as if he were some sort of pariah, or rather, the brother of one. That's him, said the cathedral guard who had shoved Mendel earlier. Mendel turned to face the guard, although he was a couple of inches shorter than the farmer. The broad, rough-hewn face looked more appropriate on a brigand than a representative of the Holy Order. <laughs> the brother of a heretic and a sorcerer, are you? Demanded the lead guard, in a tone that indicated no response from Mendel was necessary. Where is Odysseus Old Iomid? Answer now, and you may be spared his fate. Odysseus done nothing. His guilt is proved. His mastery of the arts, foul and unquestionable. His soul is lost, but yours may yet receive absolution. You have but to give him up to us. 
Those words sounded absurd to Mendeln, but the guard clearly believed everything he had just said. Despite the fact that doing so would condemn himself, Mendeln did not hesitate to shake his head. We will begin with you, then all the others here, all who are known to have fraternized with the heretic, will learn from your example. Just as quickly as they had tossed him among the others, the guards then pulled Mandeln out. They dragged him into an open space and forced him to his knees. The lead guard strode over to his horse to remove a long, braided whip, which was rolled up and attached to his saddle. The guard undid the loop binding the whip, letting the full length of its sinister weapon flow free. He tested the whip once. The crack it made shook men down worse than the harshest thunder. The guard's face was resolute as he headed back toward Mendown, who squeezed his eyes tight and prepared for the agony. It was a coincidence, that was all. Simply a coincidence. But Odysseus stared toward Sarum. A nagging doubt ate away at him from within. He recalled how terrible Lilia's angle had looked, and then how unmarred it had appeared but moments afterward. There was a horrific storm that had assailed the village just as Brother Michaelius had begun condemning him. What were the odds of lightning striking so perfectly? A coincidence. Uldissian told himself. No more. Yet even he was not entirely convinced of that. The farmer continued to stand there, unable to decide what to do. Then, a face came unbidden into his thoughts, a face he knew as well as his own, Mendeln's. And it came with a sense of urgency, of impending threat. With a wordless cry, Odysseus started back towards Sarum. Odysseus, called Lelia. What is it? My brother, Mendeln, was all he could manage. This need to reach the village before something terrible could happen to Mendeln had taken over him. Odysseus did not question how he knew that his brother was in danger. All that mattered was preventing Mendeln from coming to harm, even if it meant his own recapture. Without warning, figures appeared before him. Odysseus prepared himself for a struggle, then recognized Achilleos and Cerinthia. Odysseus? blurted the traitor's daughter. Praise be that you are all right. Achilleos was a bit too started to speak, but despite being glad to see them, Odysseus did not slow. Somehow, he could sense that time was running short. Without an apology, the farmer shoved past the pair, each beat of his heart, seeming to scream, hurry, faster. The edge of the village came into sight. His hopes rose, but then from further in echoed a sharp, cracking sound, which sent a shock of pain through Odysseus' heart. Gritting his teeth, his breath now short, the son of Diomedes charged into Sarum. The sight that met his gaze filled him with rage. He saw many fellow villagers herded together like cattle. The look on their faces were that of fear and confusion. But far worse was the sight near the ruined well. The lead inquisitor had men down, down on his knees while another armored guard ensured that he could not rise. Someone had torn open the back of Mendeln's tunic, and now a long red ribbon decorated the latter's spine. A red ribbon made by long, scaled whip of the lead guard. The officer noticed Odysseus at last, then readied the whip for another strike. Surrender yourself, Odysseus, old Diomed, or you will force me to cause your brother more suffering. His twisted words. Insisting that it would be Odysseus' fault for Mendeln being whipped again only fueled the farmer's rage further. He wanted to lash out at them in the same way that they lashed out at his brother. Just then, the length of the officer's whip seemed to curl in the air as if blown by some sudden gust of wind. The lead guard tried to bring it down, but the sinewy cord tangled around his neck instead. He tried to pull it off, but the whip suddenly tightened. The officer's eyes went wide as he tried with both hands to tear the whip away from his neck, but hacking to escape. The guard nearest Mandeln rushed to his commander's aid, while at the same time working to unsheath his weapon. However, his hand suddenly turned, causing the blade to rise above the sheath. Somehow the blade bent and buried itself deep beneath his breastplate. 
Blood spilling over his hands, the guard quickly collapsed into the other officer while his eyes were bulging and still clawing in desperation at his throat. A moment later, the officer let out a gasp and slumped near his companion, the whip remaining tight around his throat. Officer, called Lilia from somewhere behind him. Beware of the others. He glanced to the side to see the remaining Inquisitor guards converging on his position. A part of Odyssean wanted to flee, but his fury still dominated him. He glared at the men who terrorized in the name of their holy order. One of the guards immediately stumbled. His sword arm turned and expertly cut through the throat of the guard next to him. The second man let out a brief gurgle and fell. As he did, his loose weapon somehow tangled the feet of another who stumbled, spun, and hit the hard ground skull first. There was an audible snap, and the Inquisitor stilled. The remaining guards had reached and surrounded Odyssean, much like vermin surrounding a crop. In his mind, the guards were nothing more than that. Odyssean had recalled a time when he had once discovered a cache of grain infested with vermin. He had done the only thing he could. In order to keep the creatures from spreading, he burned the cache with the vermin still inside. Burned them, he thought. The foremost guard cried out. He dropped his sword and began to stare at his hand in terror as it blackened before his eyes in front of all. In a span of a single breath, his flesh cindered and the muscle and sinew turned to ash. Even the bones blackened until nothing remained. Even his armor had tarnished as if thrown into a coal-fueled inferno. His eyes collapsed and vanished, melting into their sockets with horrible finality. The crumbling figure collapsed into a heap of bones and dust. His comrades barely had time to gape in fear at his fate, for they perished in much the same way. Their brief cries came out as shrill as their deaths. They were marked by the clattering of armor and weapons. All that remained of them was ash and dust. Soon after, Odysseus returned to his senses and stared at the monstrous sight before him. He couldn't even link himself to the horrid sight. But he could also not separate the fiery urge that had swept through him, which focused on the hapless men. An unnatural silence fell over Sarum. Odysseus finally tore his gaze from the macabre remains and looked at his brother. Mendeln, panting slightly in pain from the harsh lash of the whip, finally managed to say, Odysseus, he whispered. But Odysseus continued to stare past him, where the rest of the villagers stood, still packed together, even though their captors were all dead. Their eyes were still filled with fear and dread. Dread of him. Murmuring arose within the group. When Odysseus stretched forth a hand toward them, they moved as one, away from his touch. That in turn caused Odysseus to retreat a step. He looked around and noticed that other villagers had stepped out from hiding. Faces he had known all his life now eyed him just as the former prisoners had. I... I didn't do anything, he murmured, more to himself than to the others. I didn't do anything, the son of Diomedes protested louder. But the people of Serum saw him differently now. He knew. They now believed that he had slaughtered both missionaries. How could they not? Before their eyes, one man was struck by lightning, another strangled by his own weapon, and the rest brought down in manners that no one could ever claim was ordinary. Odysseus stepped toward Tibian, the owner of the boar's head. The man had been as near a father to him as anyone else since the death of Diomedes. Tibian could at least see sense. But the stout figure backed away his stony expression hiding the revulsion and anxiety that now filled him as he mutely shook his head. Someone tugged on his sleeve, Mendeln wincing in pain whispered, Odysseus, come away from here, quickly. I've got to make them see sense, Mendeln. They can't possibly believe that- They believe. I think even I believe. That doesn't matter. Look around. You're not Odysseus to them anymore. You're the fiend that the cathedral's master inquisitor claimed you to be. That is all they see. His brow wrinkled tight. Odysseus glanced from one direction to another, but all he saw were the same dark emotions. Dorius reappeared, and with him Tiberius. The captain had his arm in a sling, and there was a gash on his right cheek. Behind the pair came the men who had been ordered to lock up the headman in his own quarters. 
Captain Tiberius was the one who finally spoke. Keep perfectly still. Don't do a damned thing, Odysseus, except put your hands behind you and- But I am not the cause of this, the farmer insisted. You have to listen to me. There are archers positioned, Odysseus. Please, listen to reason. Dorius anxiously interrupted. The farmer shook. No one would listen. He was surrounded by this insanity. They saw a murderer, a monster. Distracted by his own turmoil, he did not notice the subtle motion by Tiberius. The headman's words returned to him. Archers. Those are the ones who had been his friends. Would they rather kill him than try to understand his predicament? No, Uldissian mentioned. No! The ground shook, people toppled over, something whistled past his ear. As the tremor overtook Serum, a hand pulled Odyssean away, not Mandelm's, but Lilia's. This is our only chance. Come! Unable and unwilling to think anymore, he allowed her to guide him out of the village. Everyone around them seemed unable to keep a steady footing except Odyssean and the noblewoman. Someone shouted his name. Despite Lilia's tugging, Odysseus looked back and saw Mendeln on all fours, struggling to follow. Ignoring Lilia's protest, he broke away and went back for Mendeln. The moment Mendeln took his brother's hand, he suddenly found his footing and he led his brother through the chaos. Horses! We need horses! Odysseus was about to argue with his brother. They had no time to secure a horse, let alone five, when suddenly a horse raced ahead of them. It was followed by more all bearing the saddles of the Cathedral of Light. They raced directly into the woods and straight into the hands of the waiting Achilleos. Achilleos and Cerinthia managed to secure four of the five horses. Odysseus paused before the hunter, the two lifelong friends reading into each other's gazes. We must be away from here, Achilleos finally said. Away until they come to their senses. But both men knew that such a thing would never happen. Achilleos and Cerinthia might be able to return one day, but Odysseus knew that Mendeln, through fault of blood, would be likely saying goodbye to their home forever. We've only four mounts, the trader's daughter gasped. Odysseus, you and I could... I shall ride with you, Odysseus, interjected Lilia. She is welcome to the other horse. Cerinthia looked ready to argue, but Odysseus, reacting to the noblewoman's words, had already returned one set of reins. Mount up, everyone. The tremor seems to be subsiding, urged the archer. Sure enough, all was slowly quieting in Serum. Odysseus wondered if the tremor would renew its throes if he willed it so, then cursed himself for even thinking such a thing. Enough people had already been harmed or even slain due to all these events. To wish for something like that made him feel that he was nearly as terrible as the crimes in which he had been accused of. Sari, go back to the village. No one likely saw you. Go back to your father and your brothers. She shot him a defiant look. Not until I know you're safe. She should ride with us for a time, until things are settled. Now, no more talk, added the archer. To the southeast. Ride to the southeast. We will be safe there. Unfamiliar with that region, Odysseus eyed the hunter, but Achilleos only shrugged. Lilia then leaned near Odysseus's ear, her breath warm and stimulating. Trust me, the southeast. She whispered in his ear. To the southeast, then, and away from this madness. Odysseus growled to the others. He thought to himself that in that time, everything would resolve itself and that he would be able to begin his life anew, albeit not anywhere near Sarum. He could never trust the villagers again, just as they felt they would never trust him. The memories and accusations would always lurk in the background. All he needed was a good patch of land and strong hands. He had both. He could build a new home, make it large enough for a family. Lilia had sacrificed much for him. He had to mean something to her. Whatever the difference in their bloodlines, together, perhaps, they could put their past behind them and start a new future, if the cathedral and the temple would let them, that is.